All right, so where we had, let me just make this smaller here. Move this down here. And all right, so where we had, and I can't see, where's the, where's the chat? Let me make sure I can see the chat so people, now I'm, I'm gonna do the best I can to see stuff in the chat and see stuff that people ask me as it comes up, but I might miss it. So, you know, it's not about it. You, you can feel free to just holler out. I have a question, you know, as well. All right, because sometimes I don't see the hand go up. All right, so where we had left our heroes last time is we were doing um, SI units. So I talked about numbers and scientific notation. So just to back up a little bit, all measurement, has a value and the value is the number. And I reviewed very briefly, you should be very, you should make yourself comfortable with scientific notation. And the book does a nice job on that. You should have had it in your math class. Make sure you can do it on your calculator. And just remember scientific notation has one number to the left of the decimal. Now I'm not always, you know, you can write out a number with five zeros if you want to, but I, I, you need to be comfortable with it because I'm going to use it and you're going to work with a lot of numbers that have, um, that have scientific notation. So make sure you're comfortable with it. And by all means, if, you have, if you're struggling, it confuses you, that's what office hours are for. All right, and then the units or dimension. I'm going to talk about that next, SI units. And then, of course, the uncertainty, which I will get to today. All right, so let's do the SI units. I just started this last time. In your textbook on page 26, in table 2-1, just over here, it's a little hard to see right there. All right, there is a list of SI units. And there are way more than that, but those are the ones that we use the most in this class. So distance is measured in meters. And a meter is abbreviated with an M. And you know, a meter is a little bit more than a yard. And it's a really good idea to have a feel for how big things are. So, you know, meter, it's like a little bit more than a yard. Because one thing you want to develop as we start doing problem solving is a feel for, does my answer make sense? <clears throat> yeah. And that's a really important skill. And I would argue that the way um, our culture has shifted in the last several years, uh, just in general, you know, outside of a chemistry class, you know, you hear something from somebody or on a website, just ask yourself, does that make sense? And if it does, great. But if it doesn't, you know, that's where you should explore things a little bit more. And uh, but but, you know, developing a feel for does my answer make sense in terms of problem solving is it's a very important skill. I can do I can look at a problem and I can go, that just doesn't look right to me. And, and that's something that comes from experience. And, you know, you're, you're this is early in your problem solving career. So but asking yourself, does that answer make any sense that that's a reasonable question? All right, so distance is measured in meters. Uh, mass, which is the amount of matter, is measured in kilograms. Uh, whoops, I'm sorry, let's, let's be consistent here. I think mass should be the gram, but they didn't ask me. I wrote them a letter though. <laughs> okay, so just to put it in perspective, uh, kilograms, a little bit more than two pounds, all right? Um, Time, we don't use time very much in this class, but it might come up a little bit. It's measured in seconds, the SI unit. So lowercase s. And um, uh, number of particles, we'll deal with this a lot. So you've like a dozen, right? That's a number of things. That's called a mole. It's abbreviated MOL, which I think is hilarious. And um, temperature, which we'll deal with a lot more when you take your second semester general chem, but we'll deal with a lot in the gas laws. So if you look at the schedule, um, temperature is measured in kelvins, although we will use another unit sometimes. And this is a capital K. Now, just to give you a little bit of perspective on what temperature is, 
Temperature, uh, the official definition is temperature is relative hotness of something, which doesn't make a lot of sense. But really, temperature is related to particle speed. So um, let's write that down. Temperature is related to particle speed, which means if you increase the temperature, and there's an equation. We won't do that equation in this class, but you'll do it in, uh, in Chem 200, in general chem. Uh, but just, just realize that if you increase the temperature, particles move faster. And if you decrease the temperature, particles move more slowly. Now, what's interesting is the temperature scales that we're familiar with, uh, the Fahrenheit scale, uh, which we use in this country, and the Celsius scale, which is used in pretty much the rest of the world, uh, those aren't, they, they don't really make a lot of sense in terms of particle speed. Because if you think about it, what's the slowest a particle could go? This would be the part where we have audience participation. If it's zero, like, is it the slowest is zero, right? Right. The slowest, yeah. I mean, once you're not moving, you can't go any slower, right? So that means that there should be no such thing as a negative temperature if temperature is indeed related to particle speed. Now in San Diego, we don't get a lot of negative temperatures, but I'll tell you what, I was down at the at Fiesta Island the other morning and the little icon on my dashboard that says it's really cold outside popped up and I didn't see that since I was like in Mammoth a couple of weeks back. So, um, you know, but uh, Celsius has negative temperatures if you have friends and family back east or in the Midwest. So um, the Kelvin scale, the Kelvin scale is called the absolute temperature scale. And that means zero, that's a zero. I'm gonna put a line through it, that's a zero. Kelvin is, I don't usually put a line through my zeros, but I am gonna do it now because it looks like it says okay, uh, is called absolute zero. And that is uh, theoretically, that's the temperature where particles no longer move. There's no part of, remember we said all particles are in constant motion. That would be the temperature where they don't. So that's no particle motion. Uh, my, to my understanding, last I checked, it had never been attained, but they've gotten within a couple of millions. All right, so the absolute zero is zero Kelvin. Uh, just technically, Kelvin doesn't have a degree sign. Now, Kelvin, we'll just do this first because it's easier. Kelvin is degrees Celsius, so it's based on the Celsius scale, plus 273.15. So if you were gonna do a little conversion, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you should know that you should, you know, that would be something that on the first exam, I would kind of expect you to know. So if I have 20 degrees C, that's going to be 293 Kelvin, right? Because 20 plus 273, we won't worry about how many decimal points right now. We'll deal with that when we deal with uncertainty, right? So if I have negative five degrees C, that would be, uh, 268 Kelvin, right? Negative five plus 273. So it's pretty straightforward. It was, actually, if you're really interested in how it was determined, uh, I can show you another time. I don't wanna use class time for that. All right, questions about, uh, there's also, you know, luminous intensity, there's current things like that, but we won't do that in this class. Yes, I see a hand. Um. So, um, just to make sure I understand, because I'm a little confused, um, Kelvin is based in the with Fahrenheit, right? So it's based but, on Celsius. Oh, Celsius. Yeah, it's based on the Celsius temperature scale. Oh, I see. So when you convert it to Celsius, wait. If you convert from Celsius to Kelvin, you just add two seventy three. Oh, okay. And if we had, let's say, if we're going the other way, if we had two ninety eight K you'd say um, Celsius is Kelvin minus 273. So that would be um, 298 minus 273, which would be 25 degrees C. Oh, okay, thank you. As far as converting from Fahrenheit to Celsius, I don't expect you 
to know how to do to know that but if i gave you the equation i would expect you to know how to use it all right but that's something you can look up all right but this one you should memorize all right let me clear this off now um any other questions about this stuff Now, um, obviously, not all units are of appropriate size. So if, if I'm a, a microbiologist, a meter, right? I know you did on, on a, a, a video, you can't sit down, but my hands are about a meter apart. But a meter is way too big if I'm a microbiologist. Or if I'm an astronomer, a meter is way too small. So there are subdivisions of units. And I'm going to do a little bit of unit conversion. Uh, and these are on page 28 in your textbook. If you want to see this table right here, uh, you can refer to it. It's table uh, 2.2. And again, I know if you have like the E version, the page numbers are different, but it's in it's table 2.2, all right? And now there's a whole bunch of them there. The ones I want you to memorize are these. And again, if you grew up in the metric system, this is a piece of cake for you. Right. So, but you know, the, the rest of us who grew up in this country, unfortunately, we did not grow up with that. So, uh, centi is abbreviated with a C, and centi is 10 to the minus two. Whoops. So, as you see, I'm already using scientific notation. So, for example, one centimeter is 10 to the minus two meters. So you see that lowercase c means that number. Now, if, you know, again, algebraically, you know, you can multiply each side by 100. And so for example, you could say, or 100 centimeters is one meter, right? That, and just again, for perspective, a centimeter may be about the width of your finger. Okay, so the width of my finger, that's about a centimeter. Just to give a feel for, you know, an inch, but you know, I grew up in this system, an inch is about the distance between those two knuckles. So it's easier if you're learning this, if you remember the definition, the C means 10 to the minus two. Milli is a lowercase m, which is 10 to the minus three. So for example, one milligram would be 10 to the minus three grams. So again, that lowercase m, right, means 10 to the minus three, it's an abbreviation. So anytime you see a unit, if it has two letters, one of them is one of these prefixes. Uh, micro, so a milligram, just to put it in perspective, uh, like an aspirin tablet is 500 milligrams. So it's, a milligram is a very small amount. Micro is a Greek letter mu, and this is 10 to the minus sixth. So for example, um, one microsecond would be a millionth, 10 to the minus sixth second. So again, that little Greek symbol means that number. And then kilo is a K, and that is 10 to the positive three, so a thousand. And so for example, one kilometer, kilometer, would be 10 to the third meters. Uh, those, that, that, those four, I think, are sufficient to memorize for this class. So you should know these, all right? Have you a chance to write those down? Now, what I wanna do is, I know you guys, you know, in your lifetime, have done unit conversions from centimeters to meters and millimeters to whatever. But I want to do a few examples. I'm only going to do a handful right now, um, but we're going to do probably Wednesday. We're going to do a whole bunch of problem solving where we're going to put all of this together and we'll really get in the habit of doing these types of things. All right. But I'm going to um, let me clear this. And let me just introduce, this is the two problem solving methods we use in chemistry primarily are uh, algebra, which we've talked about, 
a little bit and we'll do some algebra as we progress and uh, dimensional analysis. Okay, and you may or may not have heard of this, but if you have, great. If you have not, welcome to the world of dimensional analysis. Dimensional analysis. This is a very powerful problem solving method. In dimensional analysis, remember the unit and the number go together. So again, if someone says, how much does that weigh? You're not gonna go, oh, it's 32. Right, you might say 32 kilograms, but you would, okay, or 32 milligrams. So dimensional analysis, what we do is we treat the units as numbers. And that means that when you multiply and divide, when you do the operation, the multiplication division on the units, it should equal the units of the answer. So the units from the operation, when I say the operation, I mean addition, subtraction, raising a number to a power, will equal the units of the answer. Now, what's really powerful about this, because I hear, I've been, like I said, I've been doing this for 30 years. And one of the most common things I hear from students is I have a lot of trouble doing word problems. I don't even know where to start this problem. If I could just get it set up, I could totally do it. And if that's you, right, I'm, I'm sure some of you probably feel that way. All right, well, what's really powerful about this is that you always know part of the answer. And so therefore you can kind of work a problem backwards. And so, and remember whatever you do to the units, you also do it to the number. So if I multiply the units, I multiply the numbers. If I divide the units, I divide the numbers. If I, rate, if I square the units, I square the numbers because the units and the numbers are part of the same measurement. So I'm just gonna do a couple of these right now, but as we progress, I'm gonna do a lot more of this. But what's powerful is I don't even know where to start, but you do know the units of the answer. And so that's what makes this really useful because then you can work it backwards. You can say, well, I need to get this unit so you can put the units in the right place. And like I said, you can literally work problems backwards. And I'll, I'll, I'll do a lot of that, probably more of it on Wednesday than today, all right? But just to do a few examples right now, let's say I have something that is 32 centimeters and I wanna convert it to meters. All right, so this, I'm just doing this, this is a very simple one. Now, that means that I need, and the, and the problem students have is the students will go, okay, I know that a centimeter is a hundredth of a meter, but do I multiply or do I divide, right? And so the way I know this is if I look at this, this is just multiplying fractions. I know that meter has to be on the top of the answer. And I know that centimeters has to be on the bottom. So see right away, uh, I know what I'm looking for. And this is a one stepper, so this one's pretty straightforward. And another thing that you wanna learn how to do to be a good problem solver, if a student comes to my office and says, I'm having trouble with this problem, I'm not gonna tell you the answer. I'm gonna ask you simpler questions that will lead you to the answer. So what you need to learn how to do is learn how to ask yourself those questions that I would ask you, and then you won't even need me. All right, so for example, I know I need, what, what do I need in the top? I need meters in the top. I need centimeters in the bottom because I want centimeters to cancel. So I just need the relationship now between meters and centimeters. And this is something I look up. Now, I've, if until I have it memorized, I'll look it up in my notes, but eventually I'm looking it up in my brain, all right? Once you have it memorized. And I know from the last screen that a centimeter is 10 to the minus two meters. So that C means 10 to the minus two. And now I can do the math, centimeters cancel. I do the math and I get 0.32 meters. Now, also, does my answer make sense? All right, so a meter is like a yard. A centimeter is about the width of my finger. So if I have 32, if I had 32, what well, if I had 32 fingers, I'd be a hell of a guitar player, wouldn't I? But if I had 32 fingers, right? That's not going to equal this much. So it should be less than a meter. That's kind of developing. I know, and again, I'm assuming you guys don't have a feel for does it make sense, but this is where you develop that. All right. Questions about this one? 
All right, let me do another one. Now, if you're going from a unit that has two letters to a unit that has one letter, you can pretty much do it in one step, or if you're going from one letter to two letters. But what if I'm going from, say, two letters uh, to two letters? So let's do one more. Let's say I want to go from, I don't know, uh, 55. That's a five. I want to go 55 kilograms. Oh, by the way, if you want to remember kilograms, think it, this is a, a silly way to remember it. You could think of how do you kill a gram? Well, you have to do it a thousand times. Uh, get it? Sorry. All right. Now, I, if I want to figure out how many grams this is, no, I'm sorry. My bad. Let's say I want to go from kilograms to milligrams. All right. So if I have 55 kilograms, how many milligrams? Now, you can even do this right away. I know milligrams are very small because there's 500 of them in an aspirin tablet. Kilogram is two pounds. So this should be a big number. So if you get a small number, you've made a mistake. Now, if I'm going from two letters to two letters, I'm going from kg to mg. If you happen to know how many milligrams are in a kilogram, that's more power to you, you can do that. But most people don't, all right? So what you can do is go from the two letter to the one letter. So I know that I need kilograms uh, in the bottom because I don't want kilograms anymore and I need grams in the top. Right? And then you can cancel as you go. Now I know that K means 10 to the third. But you see now kilograms are gone. I've gotten rid of kilograms. I've solved that problem. But do I have the answer? No, this would give me grams, which is nice to know, but that's not what I was asked. So that means I need milligrams in the top here, right? And why is that? Because milligrams are in the top here. And I need grams in the bottom here. And I know that a milligram is 10 to the minus three grams. That's just a stray mark, right? So one is understood. Okay, now, now my units cancel. And so now when I do the math, and you want me, this is a good example. I'd mentioned this the other day. Make sure that you can get the same answer as I do on your calculator. This is going to be 5.5 times 10 to the seventh. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. I'm sorry, you're breaking up a little bit. I'm sorry, I still can't hear you very well. Um, but let me walk you through it. On your calculator, depending, you know, you can do this in your head if you're good with exponents. Just send, remember when you, uh, something's in the bottom, you subtract it. So you're subtracting negative three, which is adding positive three. So this is 10 to the six, and that's 55 times 10 to the six, which is 5.5 times 10 to the seven. If you're gonna do it on your calculator, like one of these, right, a TI, you would go um, 55 times one E three divided by access to primary sources and you one E actually review the literature. I think uh, I think someone's unmuted. Is like that's that's annoying. Can you like mute them or block them or whatever? Because that that's like I can't even hear what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, can't see that who noise. it is. So make sure whoever. I think there's like Zoom bomber. So I think if it was like N H I. Yeah, just boot them out. That's it. That's it. I think I got it. Thank you. I was going to yeah. do that, but I appreciate you let reminding me. Okay. Yeah, I have it set up so it, you know people are muted automatically. But if someone unmutes themselves. Anyway, so let me let me walk you through this again. So if you're doing this on, you know, you can do this in your head if you're good at with exponents. If you're not, you on a calculator, 55 times one, it's not 10 EE3, it's one EE means times 10 to the. So one times 10 to the third, this is in the bottom. So divided by one times 10 to the minus three and then hit the equal key. 
So that's how you would do that. Again, if you're new to using a scientific calculator, that's how you want to do it. And even if you've got a fancy calculator, but you haven't done a lot with scientific notation, it's not trivial. You know, but once you've done it, again, what you want when you're taking a test, you want your calculator to be a tool. You know, like, like I think the example I gave, you know, a, a carpenter doesn't have to figure out how to use a saw, right, when they're working. So you don't want to have to figure out how to use your calculator. But anyway, all right, questions about this one? Yeah, just that. Um, Go ahead. And the second portion, that's like the confusing part because I was where? practicing these on the, yep, right, right, right where your mouse is. Yeah. Like, yeah, so it's like 55 kg. So we have a gram. We were putting, like, when I was in the tutor session, we were putting a one where the gram was. And then we were putting, like, yeah, exactly. So we did it like to convert it to grams. Like, we did something so much different. And then now I'm just confused because, like, we we're using different techniques. So, like, I don't know. The one I have for like converting grams to liters, we divided, if we have like the two numbers, we divided the top grams from the liters then multiplied that across, then divided it by um, the um, uh, like 10 minus three or whatever it is for milliliters. I don't know, It was it's completely different than what um, I was just shown. So it's frustrating because it's like, 55 kg. Uh, okay, so so first of all, if you're converting grams to liters, that's a density problem, and there is some some division in that, but you can do it the same way. But um, you now you what I do is I just go times this, but you can do 55 times 10 to the third times one, and then uh, divided by this. Right, exactly. That's what I'm saying. So I can just go right across, like 55 times yes. 10 to the third times yes. one because it would be grams up top and then put is it kilograms and where it's 10 to the negative third i put yeah. yeah exactly 10 to the negative third grams in a milligram right right so i if i were to multiply straight across and by one because this is a part i was getting mixed up in the bottom division is like would this be 10 to the third or 10 to the negative third because i was getting those mixed up does that make sense this one right here Yes. If you move this up like this, here, let me, let me, let me create some space, okay? I don't know if this is gonna answer your question, but I think it, if I understand what you're asking, if I have one over 10 to the minus three, which I have here, that's yeah. the same as 10 to the three over one. Perfect. What you're exactly, asking me? That's exactly what I'm asking you. Cause yeah. like once we multiplied across, so like we have 55 times 10 to the third times one. And then we were supposed to put the kilo or the milligrams on the bottom. So that was 10 to the negative three. So it's basically like negative a thousand. We divide that or we can just put a thousand and we divide that. Yeah, you can, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, you know, if you again, people who are pretty good with exponents realize this. And if that makes it easier, then do it that way. That's so, correct. Same thing if it was like. So sorry, right back at the beginning, um, sure. 55. Yep, next one right there. Uh -huh. Say it was milligrams to kilograms. This up top would be the exponent would be negative three, and then when I divide in the second portion, it would be ten to the third on the bottom, right? Yes. Okay, cool. That's that's all I need to know because okay, I, cool. I like using just the multiply across one. It's like I don't know why it's less confusing to me, but it is. That's fine. Yeah, it's the same thing. Okay, perfect. Yeah, let me do one more of these. Um, let's say I wanted to convert, uh, we went from a small, oh, and by the way, well, I just erased it, but uh, we, got a, we got a big number, right? And remember, a milligram is a very small amount, a kilogram is a lot, so it should be a big number. 55 kilograms is like 120 pounds, right? So there's going to be a lot of milligrams in there. And again, developing a feel for that. One more, and then I'm going to do something else with this. Let's say I wanted to go from, I don't know, 35 millimeters, and I want to know how many centimeters that is. It's the same approach, all right? Now, a lot of people, people who grew up in the metric system will know the relationship between millimeters and centimeters, and if you do, that's wonderful. But you're not really expected to for this class. But um, again, I want to show you how to work this backwards, just how to think it through. Let me just move this over. Let's say I don't know what to do. 
I look at this backwards. I go, I have no idea what my first step is, but, I'll, but what's nice, you can think of, of solving a problem as kind of like taking a trip to some place you've never gone. And you guys, nowadays we use our technology, right? But it says, where are you? Uh, it's kind of a little creepy because it knows where you are, but it says, where are you and where are you going? So, you, this, so this is the same idea. This is where I am and this is where I'm going. And a really important first step when you're doing dimensional analysis, always, always, always write down the units of the answer right away. Because I have seen so many students do everything right, but they solve the wrong problem. So make sure you write down the units of the answer because otherwise you might answer the wrong question. So let's say I don't know what my first step is here, but I, I said, well, how can I get centimeters? Well, I do know that a centimeter is 10 to the minus two because C means 10 to the minus two meters, All right? So I know that and I've got the right unit in the right place. Then um, I say, well, okay, to make that, I've got centimeters here, but I don't want meters. I don't want meters in the answer. That means meters has to go on the top because we want to cancel it. And that also means millimeters has to go on the bottom. And then hopefully you go, oh, meters and millimeters. Of course, I know that. And then you would put 10 to the minus three here. Excuse me for this little stray mark. And then make sure your units work because if your units don't work, you made a mistake. And then we do the math. And this is going to be 3.5 when you do the math. It's kind of handy to realize this just might come up. You know, you don't have, I don't expect you to memorize this one, but 10 millimeters is one centimeter. So you got 3.5 from like which calculation did you make to get the 3.5? I went 35 divided, uh, divided by 10 to 35 times 10 to the minus three divided by 10 to the minus two. 35 times 10 to the minus three divided by 10. 10 to the minus two. Okay. And then that gets you the answer 3.5 centimeters. That help? And the, the questions you guys are asking, that's exactly why we're doing this. I'm really this is like, Go ahead. This is what I meant. Like, see, that's I can see. Like, if somebody's getting stuck, that's exactly where I was getting stuck. Is the conversion, yeah, um, from from when we go to meters. But it's just if I understand correctly, when you after you multiply across. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, professor. So we multiply across, and then whatever's in the first portion of the problem, like say, okay, we do need to convert it to centimeters, but the first step is we have to get it by itself, or we have to get it to meters. So you have to put anything in the top portion of the first half in the bottom portion of the second part of the problem because there's two parts to the problem. Right. So like if it was- You're kind of thinking of doing it like, what you're asking me is, can you do it like this? Yeah, right. exactly. That's like of the course. easiest way to describe it. Yes, of course. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Nora. So um, we don't have to convert it down that one line then like, because it, it went from cent, uh, centimeters to millimeters to micrometers. And then I think kilograms is after that. I didn't get that far with my notes. But um, do we have to convert it down that line? Or, or is, he, is what he's saying you can just convert it like? He, he, he's just, he, I'm confused. He sees it differently than I'm explaining it a little bit. Um, but what you're doing is everything on the top you're multiplying and everything on the bottom you're dividing. So the way I do it in my calculator, calculator is no order of operations. In my calculator, I did this. I went 35 and then I hit times. And then 10 to the minus three is one. The, on my calculator, it's an EE -E key. There's a minus three. And then this is in the bottom. So I divided by it, one EE e minus two, and then I hit equals. What he's suggesting is kind of the same thing. You would go 35 times one EE e minus three, and then he hits equals. 
And then you go divided by one e e minus two and hit equals again. You don't have to hit the equal in between because you're doing all multiplication division now. All right, does that help? What's the minus two for? Because it's 10 to the minus two. Oh, oh okay. So the e e key means times 10 to the. And again, it does vary from brand to brand on a calculator. Go ahead, I see, I don't know how to pronounce it, Taki? Yeah, um, so on my calculator, I don't have the e e, but I have like an exponent. Does it so say exp? Sorry? Does it say exp? Um, it has like the x to the third. No, so don't use that one. Don't do, no, that's not the right one. Uh, it might be a... Uh, I think you can use, if you have the x with like the open box, you can just put 10 and then in the box, put right. to the power of whatever. Right. You can do that. You can like do a makeshift one, but if you have the EE button, you just click it once. Yeah, um, you know, it might be easier uh, for specific calculator questions to try to, you know, during an office hour, turn on your camera and we can hold up the calculator and I can look at it. Okay. okay. Or, or the other thing you could do is if you have the owner's manual with your calculator, that's wonderful, but most people don't. You could certainly Google scientific notation on your calculator and there's probably a video that'll walk you through it as well. But I'm more than happy to spend time with you on it. But I want to—I'd rather do it during an office hour than during the lecture break. Right Does that help, though? Yeah, thank you. Uh huh. All right. Now let's do something with volume. Okay, so that's just a small. We're going to do a lot more of this. Like I said, Wednesday is going to be like all problem solving. Um, volume. If you think about volume, volume is like distance in three dimensions. So volume, the SI unit is the liter. And it's a capital L. Uh, sometimes they use a script L. Now, a liter is defined as the volume. Let's see if I can draw a box on this little apparatus. Uh, look at me go. Old people using technology, right? So this is a liter. A liter is defined as a box that's 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters. That's the definition. So that means one liter. Remember, if you have a cube, uh, a rectangular solid, the volume is length times width times height. Do you have a, another question or did your hand just not go down? Tucky? Okay, I just want to make sure I would, that it, you know. All right, so one liter would be 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters, by 10 centimeters, which is a thousand cubic centimeters. And so one liter, I can draw a box, but I can't write a number one. One liter is a thousand cubic centimeters, which is of course 10 to the third. Uh, also, um, one milliliter, milli, right, is 10 to the minus third liters, or you could say multiplying each side by a thousand. Remember, 10 to the 10 to the three is a thousand. So if I multiply each side by 10 to the three, I would say 1,000 milliliters is one liter. So let's put this here. So this is something that's kind of really handy to know. So again, you can even take this a step further. A cubic centimeter, centimeter cubed, is the same volume as a milliliter. In the old days, we don't use this unit anymore, but they, it was called a cc. In medicine, they still use this a little bit. So a cc is this is set that means cubic centimeter. This is a cubic centimeter. So these are all the same volume. If you want to put it in perspective, a milliliter. If you took a standard eyedropper, about twenty drops or so is approximately a milliliter. Depends on the size of the opening valve. All right. So let me do 
uh, a couple of conversions with this. Qubit conversions get a little bit confusing. Let's say, I'm only gonna do one right now, but we'll do more of this um, on Wednesday, okay? I'm only gonna do one so you have one in your notes. And then, because uh, this is the stuff that's on homework too, which is due on Monday of next week, all right? All right, let's say that I have a tank. Let me erase just the top here. Let's say I have a tank and it, let's say that that tank is 125 cubic meters. Like a big, a big tank on a hillside, okay? A big spherical tank or something. And it's that many cubic meters. I wanna know how many liters of water would it hold, okay? So 125 cubic meters, that's gonna be uh, you know, pretty big, right? Now, if we look at this problem, I'm gonna, I don't have enough room. Uh, let's say I have no idea what, where to start. So let's work backwards. I know that one liter, I want liters on the top, is a thousand or 10 to the third. So you see I use dimensional, I'm sorry, I use it scientific notation and regular notation kind of interchangeably until I get to about 10 to the fourth. So this, you have to know this, but now I've got the right unit in the right place. So what I need here in an ideal world is I need a unit that's gonna have centimeters cubed on the top and meters cubed on the bottom. Now, you see how the units will work there. I'm gonna just erase all this stuff. But I don't have that unit. I don't know that one, but I do know this. And you see what, what I'm trying to show you is the approach to problem solving. How do I get, where am I gonna get liters? Well, I know this. So now I have to get rid of cubic centimeters. Well, that means I need cubic centimeters on the top and I'd like to get rid of cubic meters on the bottom. Now, the reason I'm thinking I can do this in one step is this is one letter and this is two letters and the second letter is the same. Now, this I don't know. This is a cubic relationship. I know the linear relationship. I know that one centimeter is 10 to the minus two meters. That I know but I want cube. Now I can't cube the unit without cubing the number. So if I cube the unit, I cube the number. So that means one centimeter quantity cubed is gonna be 10 to the minus two meters quantity cubed, meaning the whole thing. So now one cubed is one, centimeters cubed is centimeters cubed, but 10 to the minus two cubed is 10 to the minus six. Now, why did I do this? I did this because I needed meters cubed and centimeters cubed. But now you see, I have the numbers that go here. So I put a one up the top and a 10 to the minus six at the bottom. All right, and then on my calculator, I'm gonna do this on my calculator. Make sure whether you're doing it um, where you just multiply on the top and then multiply on the bottom, or if you're going 125 divided by 10 to the minus six divided by a thousand, either way, you should get the same answer, okay? So I get, I'm gonna put it in scientific notation. I get 1.25 times 10 to the fifth liters. All right, and that's the right answer. So make sure, however you're pushing your buttons, because we've had a little discussion about that and that you're both right. However you're pushing the buttons, make sure you're getting that number. Now, you know, if you write out longhand, it's one, two, five, zero, zero, zero. But see how that's, that's that, that, two, that many zeros, I'm gonna screw that up. So I usually switch to scientific notation after about three or four zeros. Right, questions about this.
So what I'd like to see when you're, there's some of this on, on homework too. And like I said, I'm only gonna do the one right now, but um, I'll, I, I'll do more of this on, more of this kind of problem solving on Wednesday, right? Um, it's very important that whatever you do to that unit, you, know, you can't just say, oh, one centimeter cubed is 10 to the minus two meters cubed because that's not right. I mean, think of it that if I had a centimeter cubed, just kind of to help you visualize, And the idea, if this is one cubic meter, that means this is 10 to the minus two centimeters. 10 to the minus two centimeters. I'm sorry, what did I just do? Sorry, this is, should be CM. And this would be 10 to the minus two meters. This is just to help you visualize it if you're having trouble understanding why. Sometimes if you kind of see, well, what exactly is a, a cubic centimeter? It's a centimeter by a centimeter by a centimeter. And so when you kind of do the volume, that's why that's where this comes up. So if you're gonna, if you're working in cubic units or 10 to the fourth units or whatever, you gotta do this little step here. And again, if you're being diligent about writing down your units right away, it almost tells you what the next step is. And that's why, that's why we teach this. And I, I don't know who came up with this. I mean, this predates me learning chemistry. This was around a long time ago. Whoever came up with this should be, a, you know, I hope they got rich from it. I doubt it. But it really makes problem solving a lot easier because it literally tells you what the next step is. You just have to kind of trust the method. All right, I'm going to erase. Professor, is there, a, is there a way to, uh, I know you use scientific notation for the end answer, but like after 10 um, divided by, or excuse me, 125 divided by um, 10 to the negative six, it was like, um, what is it, 125 billion or million? Is there any way to like shrink that so we don't have to do as many zeros? Put is it in like a shortcut. Your, well, when, when you, you can just put it in scientific notation right away. Uh, I guess so, and then still just divide scientific notation by a thousand. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, uh, you know, most the calculators have a mode where you can make it so that it's always in scientific, and you can go back and forth between regular and scientific notation. How you do that depends on the calculator. What's interesting is the graphing calculators are really, really sophisticated, but doing simple things like this is actually harder on them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think I'm going to. You're good at doing really, really, really. Hard stuff, but doing easy stuff is, is actually a little challenging. I shouldn't say easy, but less complex would be a better way to say it. All right, let me move. Uh, we got about a half an hour. So let me move uh, on to, so we've dealt with the numbers, right? We've dealt with the numbers. Now with the next thing and, and the units, now we have to deal with uncertainty and measurement. Let's see if I can pull this off. I practiced this a little earlier. I've never done it this way. So all measurement has a little bit of uncertainty. And uncertainty is really important. I mean, we, you know, we talk about stuff, you know, in, in it's kind of come up in everyday conversations with, you know, what are the odds that, you know, some that uh, someone may have side effects or something, right? From the vaccine, they talk about those percentages and having an understanding of that is really important. But all measurements have some uncertainty. And the way we express this is, is using significant figures. And let me explain that. And this is an unfortunate choice of words, in my opinion. I think when they came up with using the word significant, uh, I'm gonna abbreviate this SF just to save some writing. It, it, it really shouldn't, it causes problems. Uh, but anyway, uncertainty and measurement. Now, it's really important before we uh, explain this to understand the difference. And again, science does this. Words that are you know, used one way in everyday life are a little bit different in science. Because we use in everyday life, right? We use the words accuracy and precision interchangeably, like they, they're synonyms, but they're actually not. Accuracy is defined as closeness to correct. So how close am I to the right answer? 
And we don't always know that, but in, in the lab, we'll talk about calculating percent error. Um, when we do the, um, the measurement lab, we're gonna do graphing this week, but next week, uh, actually the next week, we'll just have a day to work on graphing. But when we come back, we'll be doing the measure, uh, experiment 1A. Precision is actually how close your answers are to each other. So you make more than one measurement. So there's one way of looking at it, but we don't always make 15 measurements. So you can be accurate without being precise, right? If, and vice versa. Another way is you could say it's the, it's the range, it's the width of the target. Of the target for lack of a better term. It's the plus minus value. So when you see, um, when they do, uh, when they talk about, uh, when there's an election coming up and they talk about, and they do polling at the very bottom of the poll, they'll say, you know, candidate one is uh, from our poll, 53%, candidate two, um, 47%, but then at the bottom, it'll say plus or minus 10%, all right? That, that plus or minus is the precision. So just to give, give you some perspective, if I was to say, that the average height of all of you in the class, the average height of you in the class is between two feet tall and 10 feet tall. That is an accurate statement. I, I would bet the house that the average, if we were to measure each one of you, that the average would be somewhere between two feet and 10 feet. So that's a very accurate statement because it's correct, but it's not very precise. Now, if I said the average height was between two foot one inch and two foot two inch, that's much more precise, but that's not very accurate. But this isn't really about you know, how precise you are, how accurate you are. It's, a, it's about correctly communicating how precise it is. Uncertainty in measurement is really about the precision. It's really how precisely did you measure and how do we express that? Because remember I said this last week, um, when you make a measurement, when you write down a measurement, why, well, why do you ever write anything down? You write something down because someone is going to read it. That might be writing a note to yourself that you're going to read later, or you might be writing something down so someone else is going to read it. But regardless of who, who's going to read it, you want to make sure that you correctly record all of the information, right? Uh, just another example of accuracy versus precision, since we have a, we have a football game coming up next Sunday. And so in football, or if you want to go, you know, uh, this is American football, right? We have goalposts, or if you want to talk about uh, football, you know, soccer in America, uh, it's the same idea. A lot, of, a lot of sports have a target. Now, accuracy means the ball goes through, right? If the ball goes there, if the ball goes right down the middle, if the ball goes right here, it doesn't matter. All three of those are equally accurate because it counts. That's it. That's all there is to it. Precision would be how wide this is. So if I change these goalposts, if I change the goalposts, whoops, to be narrower, right? Like that, that's more precise. So precision is how wide the target is. And so you're going to say, I measured this plus or minus one milliliter or plus or minus 10 milliliters or plus or minus 0.01 milliliters. That's what the precision is. All right. Um, and by the way, I, I don't know if you guys remember, if those of you who follow football a handful of years ago, the NFL was having a whole discussion on um, the, the extra points were too easy and what should they do? I wrote them a letter. I said, well, my idea, well, well, one way, make it, make it narrower. But the, uh, my idea, wouldn't it be cool if the goalpost spun? Like Marriott to miniature golf, which in my opinion is the ultimate sport. A friend of mine said, you know, hey, you want to go golfing? I said, if there's an orange ball in a windmill. Anyway, um, that's just by the way. So let me give you another example. And this will kind of explain this. So if I draw, let me, um, I'm going to draw to the best I can. I did this earlier. All right, so I'm going to go. Let's say I'm going to go from here to here. Whoops, what did I just do? Got to be there. 
Okay, now let's try it. Where's my pen? Okay. Okay, so this is a line. Now, what I'm gonna use, I'm gonna use this as my ruler, okay? And let's say that this ruler, it's fine to continue to shoot. <laughs> Darn it. My bad. Let me do this again. Let me hang on. I've got to erase this. I'm doing this backwards than I would normally do it. All right. Let's, I'm going to make this up, but so to speak. But let's say that this ruler. All right. And let's say right here. All right. Let's say that this is uh, zero meters one meter and two meters, okay? And so this is the marks on my ruler. Now I'm gonna measure this little thingy here. This little rectangle, I'm gonna measure the, so I wanna measure how big the length of this rectangle the thing that looks like kind of a, a messed up rectangle. So the marks on my ruler are every one meter. But if I'm gonna say, what's the length of that rectangle? What might you say? If you were measuring it using this, what would you say? It looks like a little over one meter. So that might be like 1.3 meters maybe. Okay, so you said 1.3 meters, okay, now. We're gonna say that. Now, are you sure about the one? I'm positive about the one. I just don't know about the, that's a point three or not. Right, the three is a guess. You got the three because you estimated, right? We guessed. So that means that you're guessing that. And now it's assumed that it's gonna be, the, this is the precision. So I'm gonna write precision here. Well, I'll write precision here. which is the same as the plus or minus value, okay? So this, you're basically saying this is plus or minus 0.1. So what you're really saying from this measurement is you're saying, well, from the ruler I'm using, this is between 1.2 and 1.4 meters. See that, does that make sense? Now, if I make this, I don't know how I'm gonna do this. Let's see if I can do this. Right there. There. But now I go like this. But I didn't want to do that. Sorry. Um, this is really hard to do in this environment. I don't want to erase these very much because I don't want to erase everything. I want to make this. Let's do it again. Hang on, just give me a second here to find where I'm at on the screen. There. There is there. Okay, now let's go there. Okay, there. 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 And there. So that's 1.2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Yeah, okay. So now this is 1.1. 1. 1. 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, 1 right, 1.5, and so on. See that? So now my marks on my ruler are every 0.1 meter. So my ruler is more precise. So now we would say, well, it's maybe 1.22, all right? And the same idea, I'm sure about the one, I'm sure about the two, but that second two is a guess. So I'm gonna put an arrow over the guess. So it's plus or minus 0 0.01, this is meters. And so what this means is I'm saying it's between 1.21 and 1.23 meters. So this measurement written this way actually means this. Now, if I took this and made it even more precise, and now I'm just gonna to try to do this by hand. Like that, let's say my marks are every 0.01 meters. 
And you're going to do this in the lab. So now I'm going to say it's 1.225 maybe. And I'm, you know, I, I think you get the idea. All right. And so I know it's hard to see on this. Um, but that number is the guess. So now we're saying it's plus or minus 0 0.001 meters. And so it's between 1.224 and 1.226 meters. So what I want you to see from this demo is that a couple of things. See, you can always read, but you can always estimate between the marks unless it's a digital device. But I want you to notice a couple of things. I'm going to erase the square. Well, I'll leave it here. First of all, I want you to notice that I always record one decimal place beyond the marks. See that? So when it was written in ones, I recorded it to tenths. When it was marked in tenths, I recorded it to hundredths. When it was marked in hundredths, I recorded it to thousands. So we always record one decimal place beyond the marks. Because if there's two marks, you can estimate between them. All right, so that's one thing. Then I want you to see also that the last number we record is the guess. This means number the hashtag recorded is a guess because we're estimating. And then it's plus or minus one in the decimal place with the guess. And what I mean by that is when the guess was the tenths place, it was plus or minus 0.1. When the guess was the hundredths place, it was plus or minus 0 0.01. When the guess is the thousandths place, it was plus or minus 0 0.001. But I, I think you can see that when you're making measurements, when numbers are, are actually values from measurements, the way you record that number actually has precision and actually means more than just the value. It's not just 1.3. It's 1.3 plus or minus 0.1. And that tells whoever's reading that measurement that the instrument was marked off in ones. And so you'll see in a lab, a graduated cylinder is, a, or a thermometer is marked off in one degree increments. That means you're gonna record it to tenths. If you have a beaker that's marked off every 10 milliliters, that means you record it to the ones place and you'd be guessing the ones place. Okay, questions about this? Professor. Uh... Yeah. Right next to range, last thing, I think it says N I N, or what's that say? This in says plus, this says plus or minus one. Oh, okay, plus in minus the decimal place with the guess. Plus minus and decimal. Thank you. Yeah, and again, he had just asked because he couldn't read my writing. Please, please do that. All right, let me summarize because my you know this is you know. All right, so let me so significant figures. Oops, not significant, are defined. I remember, I'm going to abbreviate this SF. They're defined as all the measured values plus one guess. So you are allowed one guess and only one guess. It is assumed that the last decimal place is a guess. And it's assumed that it's plus or minus one in that guess. Now, sometimes it may not be plus or minus one, but you would typically be told. So if you read the neck of a pipette, it might say plus or minus 0.05. But if you're not told, you should assume it's plus or minus one in that decimal place, in the last decimal place, all right? Now, the word significant is unfortunate because the guess is actually important, uh, but that, that's what they're called. 
uh, because you know the guess is significant in, in in the English language. The word significant means important, right? Um, but in in this context, it means all measured plus the guess. Now, this is actually very straightforward, except in our numbering system, there are ten digits. Nine of the digits only have one meaning, but one of the digits in our numbering system has two meanings. So for the car, what number in our numbering system has two meanings and what are the two meanings? Uh, is it 10? 10 is not a, not a digit of the digits. 10, 10 is two digits. But 10, 10, 10 is a hint. Is it uh, one? Five, not one. One means one. Is Five? It two? Is it tens? Zero. Get back to second grade. Zero. Zero. The number zero means two things. It means zero, right? I measured it and it was zero. Or it could be a placeholder. Remember placeholders when you learned about that? Like a product, probably like second grade, right? So you know, another way of thinking of this is all non-zero numbers are. Um, are significant, placeholders are not significant. So if a number is a placeholder, it's not measured and guessed. Uh, it's all measured and guessed. Now, when I read a number, I'm gonna get, a, I have a 13 minutes, so I'll get as far as I can get in 13 minutes. All right, so here's the rules. How do I know when, when you make the measurement, you know, because you made the measurement. But when you read a measurement, you know, how do we communicate that? So really the rules are about, how do I know if a zero is a placeholder? Right. But to start off, these are the rules. And I think the textbook makes it into four or five rules, but the, the, I just combined them. So, first of all, all non zero numbers are significant. Right? Why would you write a seven if you didn't measure or guess a seven? The answer is you wouldn't, All right? So zero is the only number that we have trouble with. So really these two rules are, how do I tell if a zero is a placeholder or it's a measure or guess, all right? So one way to tell, zeros, is it Ian's? It is today. Remember when you used to be a good, I used to be really good at spelling and that is gone. Zeros between sig figs, are significant. They're not placeholders. So if it helps, if the placeholder thing confuses you, forget it. But if it helps you remember it. So for example, the number 303, right? That the three is the guess. So that means I must have measured that zero. So this is probably marked off at the, something like this. Maybe my ruler went like this: 300, 310, and whatever I was measuring went maybe to there. Right? That would be say 303, this is my guess. And then the last rule, this is the one that textbooks kind of combine. Um, zeros after a sig fig and, so remember for and it has to be, both have to be true, and after a decimal point. are significant. Okay, it has to be both. So if it's after a sig fig, but not after a decimal point, it's a placeholder. If it's after a decimal point, but not after a sig fig, it's a placeholder. Okay, I'll give you a minute. I'm gonna just do a couple of examples with that. My dog is sitting right by me going, please, please play with me. All right, let me. So I'm going to write a couple numbers down. And what we're going to do is we're going to say, how many sig figs are here? What's the guess? Hey, okay, what does that guess mean? So here's my number. This is the number of sig figs. 
Just for fun, we'll do what's the precision. So what's the plus or minus? And then what's the range? Now, by the way, um, sig figs only apply to measurement. So a pure number has infinite sig figs. So for example, what's a pure number? If I was doing the area of a triangle, one half the base times the height, the one half is a pure number. Uh, a number derived by counting. Counting is like an errorless process. So if I was gonna take your average heights, right? Your heights would all be measurements, but dividing by the number of people, that's a, that, those are pure numbers. So if I have the number, let's just do this, 321. I'm gonna put an arrow over the guess. The last sig fig is the guess. So that number is my guess. This number has three significant figures. The precision is it's plus or minus one. So this means it's between 320 and 322. If I have the number uh, 20.8, that eight is my guess. That has three significant figures. It's plus or minus 0.1. So this means it's between 20.7 and 20.9. Okay, I'm gonna erase some of this now. So like if we were to put say like 28, would the number of significant figures be two? Yep. Okay. And then like, so 28, the number of significant figures is two and then plus or minus one and then between 26 and 29. The number 28 has two sig figs, it's plus or minus one. That's my guess. So that's gonna be between 27 and 29. That's right, sorry, between 27 yeah. and yeah. 29. Yeah, go ahead, Nora. So if I had like, the number was 45, the number sig fig would be four. No, the number is 45 is two digits. So 45.5? 45.5 would have three significant figures. Oh, I see, so if I- Let, let me do a couple more, but I'll see if, let me see if I answer your question, okay? okay. So now let, let's say I have the number um, 5, 000, 330, that number, all right? It has three significant figures? This number only, the way this is written, this has two sig figs because this zero here is after sig fig, but it's not after a decimal point. Now yeah. I know what you're thinking, I'm gonna get to it, okay? But the three is the, is the last sig fig. So this is plus or minus 10. This means the way this number is written, it's between 320 and 340. And again, I'm gonna, I know there's something that you guys are thinking, I'm gonna get to it, okay? And if I have the number 0 0.032, this number also has two sig figs. The two is the guess, but that zero is not significant. It's after a, a decimal point, but it's not after a sig fig. Okay, I'm sorry, I have to, I gotta, I'm gonna erase this because I need the space. So that means this is this is plus or minus 0 0.001. So this is between 0 0.031 and 0 0.033. Let me do two more. So I have six minutes. If I have the number 0 0.0320, zero, this number has three significant figures. So which zero is significant? The, the first one or the last one? I think the first one is significant because the last zero is a guess, right? The last zero is a guess, which means it is significant. Okay. The first Another one. way to do it, if you want to see the placeholder thing, if it's hard to do this on a screen, but if you cover up the, the zero, does it change the value? Not for between, but for these ones, right? If I cover up this zero, yeah, again, I can't do it. You can't see it. But if I was to cross that off, right? That now, now that's 33. That changed the value. That means it's a placeholder. If it's a placeholder, it's not significant. So this has three sig figs. The first zero is not significant. Again, if I cover it up, right, then it's 0.3. So it's very different. So this is plus or minus 0 0.0001. That means this number is between 0 0.0319 and 
and 0 0.0321. All right, let me kind of, I want to keep this here as much as I can. This takes a minute. This is something you have to play with a little bit and read through it. Uh, the, the lab manual does a nice job on this as well. Now, what page in the lab manual should we go to to kind of grasp this a little better? Yeah, it does. Well, yeah, I think I, yeah, that lab manual does a pretty good job on this. All right, so now, what if, but what if I did this? How do I write? This is, I know someone was thinking this. Let's say the number 300. But I really did measure that far, but I mean three sig figs. Right? I mean, if I write this, this has, as written, this has one sig fig. 300, this is one sig fig. This is plus or minus 100. This is between, let me move this. This is between, this is between 200 and 400. Now, I'm gonna, I, I saw a hand, but let me do this and then I'll take your, take your question. The best way to do it is put it in scientific notation. 3.00 times 10 to the two. Okay, this is the best way. Now, those zeros are after a significant figure and after a decimal point. Go ahead, Jay. Um, if you put a, a decimal point at the end of the 300, would that make it? That's another notation. So another notation is like this with a line. And the third notation that people use is this. So I, that... though, all three of those mean the same thing. Okay. But everyone I've talked to uh, agrees this is the best. So because I have three minutes, let me summarize this, all right? And then what we'll do is we'll do more with this. On Wednesday, I'll talk about sig figs and operations, and then we're going to do a bunch of math. We'll do a bunch of problem solving. All right, so actually, now I don't want to clear all. I want to just clear. Well, let me just, it's easier if I clear all. Okay, so if I have the number 300 written like this, okay? This is one sig fig. It's plus or minus 100. This is between 200 and 400. If I write, um, oh, wait, hang on, let me, I'm sorry. In scientific notation, this would be three times 10 to the two. And again, this is plus or minus 100. This is one sig fig, plus or minus 100. And this is between 200 and 400, that's the range. So this number written this way means this. If I wrote it, use, I'm gonna use the, the line over it. If I write it like this, this is in scientific notation, this is 3.0 times 10 to the two. This number is my guess. I use an arrow to indicate, just when I'm teaching, okay? I don't write it that way. This is two sig figs. And this is plus or minus 10, because that's in the tens place. This is between 290 and 310. If I write it, with a line over the second zero. In scientific notation, this is 3.00 times 10 to the two. This is three sig figs. This is plus or minus one. This is 299 to 301. And then the last one, if I wrote it like, if I have this, if this is what I write, that has four sig figs. I don't have to put this in scientific notation because I already, because this zero, is after a significant figure and after a decimal point, and these are between. If I wanted to put it in scientific notation, it would look like that. This is plus or minus 0.1. So this is 299.9 to 300.1. Right. So it's 11 o'clock, there's a good stopping point, but let me just summarize this real quick. So I think you can see that Right, it's kind of a bugaboo with zeros, depending on how you write it. In your math class, math only deals with the value, and that's plenty. But in a math class, these numbers all mean the same thing. That's because they all have the same value, but they have different precisions. And so that's the habit we're gonna, it's really, you'll, it, it's much more easily illustrated in the lab. We're gonna do more with this in the lecture. All right, so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna stop the screen share, 
I'm going to turn off the recording. And then, you know, those of you got to go, I can hang out for a little while and answer a few more questions, but I know that some of you have to leave. So let me just do this and then I'll see you on um, Wednesday. Let me stop the recording. <laughs>